privilege to be here with these panelists in particular. When I introduce uh, Fred, I often say his brain should be declared a national park. <laughs> uh, he, I think he knows, uh, he, he, he is so extraordinary. In fact, the book which he was reading from was uh, assigned to astronauts at NASA, uh, by NASA, to help because it was uh, considered to be such an uh, appropriate representation of what it might be like to terraform. Uh, a planet, which I think is pretty exciting. And Mark is uh, great. I haven't, we haven't been on a panel together in a while. I think Mark Bauerlein is one of the most gifted critics and social thinkers out there right now, and it's a real privilege to be here. And uh, he was modest in introducing himself, but uh, I, think, I think he just gets up and writes about two, two or 3,000 publishable words every morning. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> so I wanted to finish, complete your thought, which you didn't quite have time to do, which was that uh, you know, human, human beings stopped being uh, animals and started being animals when they learned how to tell jokes, isn't that it? <laughs> right? among, when, other among other things. <laughs> so uh, how many of you are teachers? Yeah. How many of you are administrators? OK, get out, you guys. <laughs> no, really, it's OK. I'm an administrator. <laughs> Some of my best friends are administrators. How many people teach or have taught uh, K or, or pre-K uh, five or six, yeah. And middle school, oh, really? and high school, that's great. I'm, uh, I'm going to try to um, give you something I hope that you can use today, no matter uh, which level you're teaching at. And I have taught at all of these levels, including also the undergraduate level and the graduate level. I ran a graduate program in creative writing and I've written curriculum. And, uh, uh, and uh, because you're teachers, I know you're, I hope you are looking for something useful, and I'm going to try to, to provide you with that. Um, 15 minutes, right? Yeah. OK. The, uh, the subject is you know, literature across time. And uh, I hope that my little talk fulfills that in, in two ways, uh, because it's literature in time, but also across time. Uh, and I'm in, as opposed to focusing on very large subjects, I'm going to talk about something much more exciting, which is prosody handbooks. <laughs> yes. Very exciting. I know you're all thinking now, why didn't I get that cavity filled this afternoon? <laughs> but, the, but in fact, uh, they are tremendously exciting and tremendously important. And their fate is quite uh, interesting in modern pedagogy at all levels. We're going to talk about that. Uh, the the uh, I think it's be important to begin by defining terms and defining the subject. Uh, prosody is the more old-fashioned term. It was appropriated by the linguists. Do I? I don't have to hold that up, do I? Is that okay? Um, if you could just hold it's it. It's a little hard. I want to gesticulate. I'm Mediterranean. I, <laughs> I, I can't. With okay. A, if you just set it on the podium, that should be fine. Here, okay. That's good. Here. I'll try to do it like that. Sorry. I didn't pick it up. The, uh, it's, that's the uh, sort of old-fashioned term, I suppose. It was, uh, of course, uh, a term that was created by poets before being appropriated by philosophers, critics, and linguists. Pros oida, that which exists in addition to an ode, the ode being the words, uh, that which exists in addition to it being the music, so the music of the words. In modern times, that term has been sort of appropriated by linguists to indicate the uh, contours of all natural speech, uh, which are tremendously important. Uh, to all, all languages and different in all languages. And we tend to, we now often use the word versification, referring to the poetic quality of creating verses and how we do that. This is a, one of the perennial and tremendously important subjects in poetry, as far as I can tell, universally. There's a huge literature on it in Russian, in Arabic, in Farsi, in uh, every language that I've ever encountered. The debates over Hebrew versification went on for thousands of years before in the 18th century, <coughs> 1770s, I believe, a man named Bishop Louth uh, figured out how Hebrew prosody actually worked, debates which were then recapitulated in, the, in, in very fiery exchanges over the work of Whitman, who imitates it in English. Uh, but leaving all of that aside, let's try to just get at the heart of what the subject is, because it's particularly difficult to define. Because it's not really something uh, that one um, can define with words, writers tend to think of everything that they do as having meaning and being definable semantically. 
But it's important to remember, and this is crucial, and this is where I'm going to begin to, I hope, give you something that's useful. It's important to remember that poems not only say things, but crucially, they also do things. And if we don't grasp what poems do, we will never be able to teach them well or even understand them. And to coin a distinction, I would say what we're talking about is the difference between meaning and meaningfulness. And prosody is about meaningfulness. And it's extremely difficult to say what prosody means, even though one can feel its meaningfulness. So there's a really easy example of this that I've developed to use. And there, we could do any number of them. I'm going to recite for you a, a well-known poem by uh, Robert Frost. Uh, it's a poem he wrote, apparently, when he was on his way home and he was a poor poet and he didn't even have enough money to buy his children a Christmas present. And that, of course, one of them. That's a hypothetical basis for the poem. I think I know whose woods these are. Though his house is in the village, he will not see me stopping here to watch the snow fill up his woods. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. So I've kept the meter, actually. I haven't even disturbed the meter, but I have disturbed something else. What I've done is I've removed Frost's sly hyperbatten. And the hyperbatten is, uh, is uh, like, uh, it is speaking like Yoda that I am. <laughs> Yoda always speaks in hyperbatten, meaning a rhetorical figure whereby words don't necessarily appear in the, in the order that they would appear in English, which is an analytical language, mean, meaning it depends on word order. Obviously, this is wonderful. Everybody here teaches some Latin, so you know. In English, the girl loves the farmer is very different from the farmer loves the girl. The farmer hopes that the girl loves the farmer, but she, she may not. She probably doesn't. We never get to find out. Even. <laughs> it's always the farmer loves the girl, and the girl's saying, oh, fine. But obviously, in Latin, you could say Agricola ama puelam or puelam ama Agricola, and it would mean exactly the same thing because of the inflections. It's a synthetic language. English began as a synthetic language. <laughs> but uh, turned into an analytical language. Uh, and uh, Old English is, is a synthetic language. So uh, the farmer loves the girl is very different from the girl loves the farmer because the inflections aren't there. It's the word order that matters. So Frost has very cunningly used some of this. And when you remove it, however, the poem pops like a soap bubble because the poem doesn't go, I think I know whose woods these are. It goes, whose woods these are, I think I know. This house is in the village, though. You will not see me stop it. see me stopping here to watch the snow fill up his woods. You can hear the difference, right? One's a postcard. One's one of the greatest poems ever written by an American. Uh, <laughs> the interesting thing is, of course, that if you were to diagram the sentences, would there be any difference? There's no semantic difference whatsoever. <coughs> Prosody, versification. The, poem, the words are doing something when they've been organized in this way that they cannot do, that one cannot, one would seek in vain to describe uh, what is happening in that poem and why it has that effect on us if one cannot at some level describe what the words are doing. And of course what I've removed is the rhyme. Good luck saying what rhyme means. Uh, two words I, kissing. Yeah, two words kissing. That's what it does. That's not what it means. The, uh, Dave makes it a troublemaker this guy. <laughs> the former poet laureate of Colorado. And one of the, most, one of the greatest poets alive, I think. The, uh, uh, you know, what does it mean to say, no, though, snow? It could mean anything. Whose woods these are? Heck, I don't know. You know <laughs> I'd, I'd like to steal his horses, though. I mean, <laughs> they, 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 they don't mean anything in and of themselves. He will not see me stopping here, but he'll know when his horses go. <laughs> the, the, uh, I mean, you could do anything. <laughs> their, their meaning is not predetermined. And in fact, if we seek for their meaning, Instead of looking at their meaningfulness and what they do, we're going to be in, in a lot of trouble because we'll never get where we want to be. So all I would suggest that prosody and versification are absolutely crucial and, and absolutely essential to what we're trying to do when we teach young people poetry, even if they're not going to be um, poets, just as we teach mathematics to people who are not necessarily going to be mathematicians or music to people who are not necessarily going to be musicians. We would never dream of teaching music if, uh, assuming it isn't just a music history course, without, of course, trying to help people to play a little bit of it and understand it. 
So the way that, the first way that this is literature across time is that, of course, it's pretty difficult to have prosody without time because you have to have it proceeding through time. It has to be embodied in time. And it's very important. And th this is why, as Dana Joya and many others have pointed out, as I agree, it's really quite important to retain the, the practice of memorization and recitation, or at least of reading aloud, putting the poems, if you can, into time, into the air and into time. That simple action pedagogically is something that I encourage you to do at every single level. If you're, at high, if you're doing, working at the high school level, how many of you know about Poetry Out Loud, the National High School Recitation Project? Talk with me afterwards, I'll fill you in. It's an NEA uh, project, it's fantastic. Children, uh, high school kids um, competing and reciting well-known poems from memory. It's absolutely wonderful. And Dave and I have been very involved in that in Colorado. <laughs> The other, so that's one aspect. The other aspect is what has happened to our pedagogy, which is why, of course, I wrote a, I've written a poetry handbook, textbook. And uh, what's happened, basically, is that I, I and I, I now agree with the great scholar Norman Fruman, the critic of Coleridge, who argues this really began with the new critics who came in in the 40s and wanted to displace an older generation of belletrists and brought in a very high-powered, basically, uh, I would call it a hermeneutic approach to literature where, frankly, they were primarily concerned with describing the meaning of poems, the meanings of poems. Not appreciating them, but describing their meanings. And these were very fine writers. Many of them were very fine poets. John Crow Ransom, an extraordinary critic and scholar. Uh, but the, the fallout from that over time, Fruman argues very convincingly, is uh, that we, we wound up with a, with a kind of critical culture and a pedagogical culture where we were overemphasizing the meanings of poems and losing sight of some of those inarticulable things that we can feel that are meaningful that um, are much harder to describe because as soon as you put them into words, it seems to sort of slip away like a, like a uh, greased watermelon. So I want to read, I, read I, I went and I read, I actually did go and assemble about 175 poetry handbooks over time. I don't have them all, but I have a lot of them. And um, you know what's in, I'm going to read you a little, just a page or two of this. Yeah, we have time. Um, that rings a bell. The, uh, so Mary, here's a quote from Mary, Mary Oliver, um, where she, uh, Acquaintance with the main body of English poetry is absolutely essential. It is clearly the whole cake. Well, what has been written in the last hundred years or so without meter is no more than an icing. And indeed, and this is primarily a free verse poet, and indeed, I do not really mean an acquaintanceship. I mean an engrossed and able affinity with metrical verse. To be without this felt sensitivity to a poem as a structure of lines and rhythmic energy and repetitive sound is to be forever less equipped less deft than the poet who dreams of making a new thing can afford to be. The poets say this again and again and again. And yet, there's a whole group of these poetry handbooks, many of which are quite powerful, or popular rather, which says, you know, please uh, don't, just don't pay any attention to that meter over in the corner. Many of these works take, and I'm going to just read a, about a, two pages here. Many of these works take an organicist and ultra-romantic approach. This is where I get to snarl a little bit. Uh, to take uh, an organicist and ultra-romantic approach to poetic composition, which presumably derives in its longest view from weak misreadings of Emerson by way of Wordsworth and Rousseau. While most of the authors do have compelling things to say about the sources of inspiration and strategies for composition and the generation of content, there is generally a strong underlying polemic in many such works against the teaching, study, and use of traditional metrics and verse form as restrictive and spiritually debilitating. A few examples. In the Mind's Eye, A Guide to Writing Poetry uh, by Kevin Clark, he writes that most poets believe that the imagination can catalyze magically surprising language without the presence of predetermined structures. Note the ancient canard that metrical forms have predetermined structures, whereas free verse poems do not, which they do if they're good. While Clark claims to be even-handed writing that skilled formal poets can use the demands of form to innovate, he devotes a very short amount of time to talking about this. Um, and then the titles are typical uh, of the chapters. Conflict and Transformation, Do Poems Have Plot, Empathy and Creativity, Poetry and Eros, and so on. You notice they're all based in subjects. They're all about something. Poems, you know, don't have to be about a lot. Um, this is a very common trend. Some are even more aggressive in their criticisms in uh, 
Creating Poetry, a book by John Drury from 1991. He concludes, the problem with many fixed forms, by which he means meter, is that they are so rigid they don't give the poetic imagination much freedom or provocation. They are more for puzzle maker, the ingenious turner of phrases. Uh, this, a lot of this descends from modern poetics, where uh, poets became so envious of the prose writers, I think, that following Robert Creeley and Charles Olson, they said, you know, form is only extension of content. Content always comes first. So I'm here to suggest that that isn't true and that you should seek out the good handbooks by people like John Hollander uh, and Stephen Fry and the Book of Forms by Louis Turco and John Hollander's Rhymes Reason and several others. And I have about two minutes, I think. So I wanted, I could go on with these examples. They're legion. I would be suspicious when somebody ever starts to tell you that the way to teach poetry and the way to think about poetry and the way to present poetry is only to focus on its meaning. Think about its meaningfulness. Think about its music. The music is the kiss. There's the two words kissing. Um, you wouldn't do that when you were eating an apple. You wouldn't hold it up and say, you know, it tastes good, but what does it mean? <laughs> it's uh, Those are nice shoes, but what do they mean? You know, I, it's the same question. Why wouldn't you just enjoy them? And that's a, actually a, a radical thing to say. It's a little bit disruptive. Let me give you one more example from Robert Frost that I particularly like. Let's see how many of you know this. I expect many of you do. Nature's first green is gold. Harvest, Harvest you to hold. <laughs> Her early leaves of flower. But only so an hour. Oh, I love, what, a, what a conference. Well, then leaf subsides to leaf. So we so the same green. So dawn, goes, so dawn goes down today. Nothing Nothing goes goes down. Okay, how many syllables in every line? What's the meter? Short. Yeah, they're short. I'm afraid you're going to have to be a little more specific. <laughs> 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 Three. Oh, yeah. Trimity, right? Yeah. First, and there are a bunch of reversals. And so in nature's first green is gold. Her heart is huge to hold. Her early leaves a flower. But only so, right? Got this? You all know it by heart. I, I might cry. And there's one line with five syllables. Which one is it? The last one, which is also the title. What's the missing syllable? Which one is missing? I'll give you a clue. It's an acephalous line. Which one is missing? <laughs> yeah, I told you we were going to do something. We're almost done. Promise. Which one is missing? I'm not going to tell you. You have to answer. No, you don't get to answer. <laughs> Her heart is, listen to it. Listen, well, listen, listen. Syllable. The first syllable. Yeah. Her, nature's first green is gold. Her heart is huge. Her heart is huge to hold. Her early leaves a flower. But only so an hour, then leaf goes down to leaf, then leaf subsides to leaf, so Eden sank to grief, so dawn goes down to day, nothing gold can stay. It's a headless line, Aesopolis, the first one, the unstressed one. Now here's a genius at work. Now I think this is true, people. You may scoff, scoff away, but I'll leave you with it. What's the word after the missing syllable? That is a genius. <laughs> Think about it. Uh, Frost does this all the time because he's that good. Uh, it would be impossible even to begin to have that conversation about what that might possibly mean if one could first apprehend the meaningfulness of the music of the poem. Find a way to give your students that meaningfulness. It's okay to just have them spout rhymes and play games and feel the meaningful joy and beauty and delight of two words kissing or of meter or of rhythm. They want to do it anyways. One, two, buckle my shoe. Three, four, shut the door. Five, six, this gives me kicks. Thank you very much. Yeah.